Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Eric Jenkins, and I'm the Account Manager for Connecting Up in TechSoup New Zealand. And I would like to welcome you to the webinar Cloud versus Server Infra versus Cloud versus Local Server Infrastructure, which will be presented by Matt Walton from InfoExchange. We'll start with just a little bit of housekeeping here. All the lines are muted, so if you have any questions during the session, please type it in the questions box on your webinar panel, and Matt will answer them at the end of the webinar. Please note that your comments and questions will not be appearing to the entire group. If you have any technical issues, please also type it in the question box, and I'll try my best to help you out with it. Please note, if you are on a Wi-Fi connection and have multiple programs open, this can sometimes affect the quality of the audio and video of the webinar. If possible, please try to close all other programs just to help you have the best experience that you can today. Before we start, I'd also like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and a link to this recording will be sent to you all within a week after the webinar ends. You will then be able to access it at any time. That's about it for me. So now I will pass it over for Matt, who will take it from here. Thank you, Eric, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. So today we're going to talk about uh, moving to the cloud. Uh, but also exploring when we may need uh, lo local servers. So this is one of the most common questions I get as a as an IT consultant in the not-for-profit uh, sector. Um, do I still need a server or, or can I move everything to the cloud? So hopefully today's webinar will give you a bit of a, a sense of what the right solution is for your organisation and um, where to move and, and where to stay. So I think um, as, as a not-for-profit ourselves, we only work with other not-for-profits. And as you can see by the, the range of not-for-profits there, we do work with all shapes and sizes. So uh, we are agnostic as well in terms of our solutions. So I know I'm a big advocate of cloud, but uh, there all also is quite commonly uh, need for local server infrastructure. So we do implement both solutions. So I'll try to not make this session too one-sided in terms of just telling you about cloud. Or we'll, uh, there'll be that balance of um, local infrastructure as well. But uh, I think the other key point around all these different clients, and, and again, we have hundreds of them, is around there is no one solution uh, the total solution for everyone. So but all of these clients that you can see on, on the screen all have something different about their environment. So they all have some different solutions. Yes, many of them are using some of the same products uh, or services, but uh, their solutions are slightly different based on what they need and what they have and what where their office is located and how many staff and how their staff works. So uh, there is no one, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'll just tell you, how to do it and, and off you go but uh, it's a it's a little more nuanced than that so again hopefully today we're going to work through um, some topics that will will help you understand uh, how to make those decisions so really the first one is is looking at uh, technology requirements and, and what are the things you need to think about um, I'll give you some examples of trends in the sector and some of what other people are doing and some of the results of a recent survey we did. I'll explore some cloud-based systems as well as cloud server, which we'll talk about in a minute. I'll also make sure I talk about local infrastructure and when you need those servers. And one of the key uh, factors for all of these things, whether it's local or cloud-based, is your internet and network connectivity. So I'll spend a little bit of time in the session talking about that as well. As Eric said, I will try and um, save some time for questions at the end. I occasionally do get a bit overzealous in these things and, and talk too much and run out of time, but uh, I will make sure I can stay uh, afterwards, even if we do um, sort of get close to the hour. Otherwise, you can all email me or contact me offline uh, after this session if we don't have time for the questions. But uh, as Eric said, feel free to type them in the in the chat box and uh, we'll, we'll get to them in the end. So let's start with talking about what NFPs typically need. Now this is by no means a comprehensive uh, list of everything that you could possibly ever need or think of from an IT perspective. These are just some common ones that we see that when you're developing your IT plan or, or trying to determine 
what do I need to put on a server or what do I need to move to the cloud? These are some of the common things that I wanted to raise with you just to sort of uh, remind you of some of the things to think about. So the common ones are those business systems that everyone has, whether it's a finance system, um, HR, time and attendance type systems, payroll, uh, donation management, and, and depending on the uh, type of sort of system or, or the type of uh, organization you are, that could, again, be quite broad around member management, customer relationship management, so CRMs, client management, case management systems. So all of these systems that, again, some of them are cloud-based, some of them are server-based. So uh, you essentially need to map out all the different systems that you have and just understand what you need and what they need from an infrastructure perspective as well. The other key ones are, are document management, images, videos, archives. So again, these are one of the most common things that people put on a file server in their office. The good old, you know, let's just dump all our documents on a file server, which is quite common and, and still quite a, a good solution in, in some scenarios. The other common one that most people either used to have uh, or, or some of you may still have is email calendars, calendars and contacts. So things like your exchange server sitting on that server in your office that uh, used to manage all, all those emails for you. Um, but to access all of these systems, you need a range of other things. So uh, obviously most offices need internet connectivity and remote access. So things like VPN connections or a remote desktop or Citrix or something like that. That means you can log into servers from remote uh, locations. You obviously need your devices, so your PCs and your laptops and your printers and scanners and all those sort of things, um, as well as becoming more and more common is the mobile devices on your, your iPads and phones. So depending on which ones of these you use, again, depend changes the solution that uh, is suitable for you. Um, we talked a little bit about client management and CRM as well as uh, all those other tools that you use for reporting and, and reconciliation. So more and more are using um, dashboard tools or business intelligence tools. So things like Calxa for, for on top of your finance systems or Power BI or, or um, you know, those sort of tools that create those dashboards and give you that reporting that you need for your financial reporting or your quarterly reporting. Then you've got all those uh, external things. So all that online presence stuff around your website, your social media, your e-newsletters, your uh, things like Hootsuite that manage your social media. Many of you are now doing member portals or client portals where they log in and access or, or update their information. So these are all things that, again, some can sit on servers or, or sometimes need server or cloud infrastructure. And then there's a whole suite of tools that you use for internal communication. So video conferencing, intranets, chat forums, uh, instant messaging, SMSs, all of those sort of things are around internal communication. And then there's all the security stuff around firewalls and user management and mobile device management and backup and disaster recovery. So, uh, not trying to uh, you know scare you too much, but these are just some of the things that you need to list out for your organization and understand, okay, what do I actually need? So before you know whether it's server or cloud, you need to understand your requirements. So really that's, I'd recommend that as a first step before you start sort of getting bogged down in uh, cloud versus server. So what we're seeing in the sector, and, and these next couple of slides are guided by um, the not-for-profit survey that Connecting Up and Info Exchange put out annually, and um, there's some survey results in this slide, but we can also, uh, if you feel free to ask a question or send me or Eric an email, we can send you the full results if anyone's interested. But uh, some of the common trends in the sector, now I'm assuming these aren't surprises to most of you either, is there is a strong move to cloud-based applications. So some of that is by uh, the strategy of the not-for-profit. 
some of it is just by evolution of things like Myob or Zero. You know, a lot of people are moving to cloud-based finance systems, for example, like Zero or Payroll. And if you pick Zero, then it's cloud-based, whereas some people are still using the the server or desktop-based Myob, for example. So it's just a gradual move to those sort of systems, um, and we're seeing. Uh, and we'll talk more about it later, things like uh, Office 365 or, or Gmail, uh, web platforms like Squarespace and WordPress, those sort of things that are easier and easier to get um, cloud-based. Obviously, that flows on to the second point around the decrease in local infrastructure. So well, part of it is around a lot of people really not being that um, interested in managing servers anymore. So not-for-profits and whether they're IT staff or, or in most cases finance managers and CEOs are just not, not fussed about replacing their local servers. So when it comes to those servers being five, 10 years old, when they come for renewal, often these managers are looking at other options. Part of the push for cloud and the decrease in local infrastructure is that uh, people are becoming more and more mobile. Now, whether that's working from home or whether that's uh, wanting to be out and about in clients' homes or accessing the information from remote locations. So that push for mobile devices, again, dictates where you store your information and how you access that. Um, and the other key, uh, I suppose, factor behind why you move things to the cloud is the increased importance of data and information. So it's becoming more and more common that funders and donors and governments are asking for more and more information about outcomes and, and what are we doing with the money that we're giving you. So not-for-profits are having to more and more understand that data and be able to display that data and prove what the outcomes are. So instead of just keeping paper-based case notes, you actually need to use electronic systems to track outcomes. So there's a big shift from that casual, uh, informal, paper-based recording of information to formal tracking of, of those sort of things. So all of these are key trends that we're seeing more and more in a whole range of not-for-profits. And I'm expecting that uh, at least some of these will be prevalent in your organisations as well and be some of the things that are pushing you to cloud-based uh, systems. Okay, so based on that survey, here are some of the uh, sort of stats around moving to the cloud. So as you can see there, there actually has been a 30% increase of organizations moving to the cloud just in the last 12 months. Now that's that's pretty huge. Uh, now the, um, the key factor as well is, it's actually not that relevant uh, that the SATs say, whether you're a small organization or a large organization, whether you move to the cloud. Now there's obviously a few differences there, but overall, we're seeing both large and small move to the cloud. Um, and it's it's just a different process. So I've, I've worked with both large and small, and I can tell you that from a small organization perspective, it's great to be able to just pick everything up and move it really quickly and easily. But we're also moving, working with large organizations to move them, and sometimes it's an 18 month process or longer to gradually move applications um, to, to the cloud. So there's no right or wrong way, but um, what we're seeing is a, is a big trend for moving across. Those numbers down the bottom are also uh, the some of the reasons for those people who aren't moving to the cloud or haven't yet moved to the cloud, they're some of the common barriers. Um, so one of them, the biggest increase is that Basically, those people who haven't moved yet or do not plan to move, really the main reason they're not moving is because they just don't know enough to implement. So they, many of them know they should go to the cloud, but they just don't know how or 
haven't got the internal expertise or their or their partners, whether they're local IT support companies or an individual IT staff member that just doesn't have that expertise in cloud, and is more comfortable dealing with the server that they're fully uh, fully aware of. So that can often be a barrier, because a lot of these other barriers are actually coming down. So last last year, data security was was a bigger uh, bigger concern for many people. But the myths around that are starting to, or the education around that is starting to um, be, make people more aware that uh, it's actually safer than they originally thought. So that's actually decreased 11% from last year um, as a barrier. So people are less concerned about data security now because they're more comfortable that cloud can um, be secure. The other one is is the expensive or insufficient internet. So NBN is part of it, but also just the the availability of other types of internet connections through a whole heap of other telecom providers. It's becoming cheaper and uh, just more accepted that you need a better quality connection. So uh, that that barrier is reducing, and the same as migration costs. These things are actually getting easier and easier to implement. So for with, with each new tool that someone like Microsoft or Google uh, come out with, they're, they're getting easier and easier. So less and less you need to, to hire an IT company to do it all for you. In some cases, you can do it all yourself, um, or at least some of it yourself. So there's some of the barriers. And as you can see, they're sort of starting to, to break down and they're becoming less and less of a reason. And those people who have recently invested in their own infrastructure also is becoming less and less. Where people are, um, you know, temp who might have bought a server five years ago, they're coming around now. And, and likewise with those who weren't sure a few years ago, their servers are coming out of warranty and they're, they're starting to move across. So, as I said, if you want more stats on that, we can um, we can get them for you. The other thing, um, this. This slide is about different applications. So the key one that I wanted to highlight is uh, the big decrease in exchange service. So the 21% there in the middle, the yellow box, uh, there has been a big de decrease in that primary email application and an increase in Exchange Online, which is now the most popular email platform for not-for-profits. So it's off, basically it's free as part of Office 365. So it's almost a no-brainer for most people now. Um, there's also been increases in Office 365 for things like SharePoint and OneDrive as well. So there's been a 7% increase in that for file sharing as well. So it, again, just helps reiterate a trend um, for, for moving things to the cloud. The other thing is um, people are starting to be conscious of overseas-based companies, so stuff like uh, Dropbox or, or the G Suite is, um, I believe, still, uh, although there is some Australia presence for some of the other apps that uh, traditionally were overseas, but uh, things like Dropbox and, and Google, um, I believe, are still hosted overseas. So people are still leaning away from them. Um, and a lot of the setups for those sort of things were once off personal sort of setup of a Dropbox or a, or a personal Google whereas people are now moving to those organization-wide document management solutions. So I think that's the key, where um, people are starting to plan that better and not just using the ad hoc personal account. So there's some of the Microsoft uh, sort of applications that are growing and also uh, you know some of the other ones that are out there in the market but um, just wanted to take a step back and for those of you who still aren't totally clear what I'm talking about when I say what is the cloud um, I won't spend too long on this for those who already know this but uh, basically it's anything that's uh, any IT service that's delivered over the internet so Often when I go into organizations and we start talking about the cloud, people are very fearful and they say, no, we're not, we're not going to the cloud. I'd never store anything in the cloud. And then we start to talk about what they're already using and we find out that most people are already doing some form of cloud-based uh, 
application. So the examples there, even everything from Facebook to Gmail to uh, Dropbox, all of those things are already cloud-based. So sometimes people just don't don't understand that. And cloud isn't new. Cloud is, you know, Info Exchange, for example, were hosting an application for not-for-profits uh, well over 10 years ago. And we hosted in a data center in Port Melbourne and we deliver that to not-for-profits via a web browser. So that's cloud-based, and we've been doing that for well over 10 years, and, and so have all these not-for-profits that have been accessing that. So it's not necessarily a new thing, but often the term is new. So really the, the main difference or the, the characteristics, I suppose, of cloud services is that they come with inbuilt redundancy. So instead of everything sitting on one server in your office, you have people like Microsoft or Google with banks and banks and hundreds of servers running that function. So whether it's Gmail or, or Microsoft uh, Office 365 email, there's hundreds of servers. So if one server dies, it just moves to another one and it keeps running without you noticing. So we tend to see the reliability is actually uh, better on those sort of things. And most of these companies actually give you service level agreements of let's say 99.9% .9 availability, they actually guarantee that. And they can give you a refund if it's the service you're paying for. The other great uh, feature of cloud is its uh, scalability or expandability. So we've had several organizations, clients of ours, who have merged with others. And luckily, they've been on Office 365 for email, for example. And they've just been able to add an extra couple of hundred licenses onto their existing uh, account and um, add the new users in. Whereas if they were running on an exchange server for their email, for example, they would have to buy a new server and buy licenses and install it and you know do a whole heap of work and a whole heap of expense to get that up and running. The other one, it's usage-based. So for those that aren't free, obviously we'll talk about some of the free products, but uh, you know, for those that aren't, it's just a per user per month cost. So it's just part of your operating expense. You don't need to go off and get a $50,000 grant to buy a server and install it and buy the licenses anymore, which is what I used to have to do when I was the sort of CIO of a, not, a large not-for-profit. And we used to have to do that every couple of years. We'd go to the board cap in hand for, for big chunks of money. Um, whereas now people are just adding, you know, six dollars a year a month on top of their operating expenses when they need, whether it's Myob or or Office or whatever it may be. And probably the most important or the most commonly uh, needed uh, per sort of reason for moving to the cloud is that it's accessible over the internet and people can work anywhere. So even right now I'm I'm sitting in my uh, dining room presenting this webinar from home uh, because it's quieter than my office. So that's quite common across the sector now, uh, whether you're working from clients' homes or whether you're working from your own home or just giving you flexibility, that um, cloud-based uh, is, is a lot more conducive to that. It means you can just access it via a web browser. So I won't list off all of these, uh, but I just thought I'd put a slide in um, just to list off some examples of cloud-based applications. Now, uh, you are getting these slides, so uh, feel free to, you know, don't worry about taking notes, you'll, you'll get all these later. But here are just some examples, by no means a comprehensive list again, uh, of some of the cloud-based systems that um, we, we see in the sector and are becoming more and more common. So most of you would already have most of these, I'd imagine. So we've touched on some of these already, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, you are understood what we call the business case. So these are the things that you can go to your board or your managers to and say, look, I, I want to move to the cloud, uh, but um, these are the reasons for doing it. And usually, knowing most not-for-profits, uh, there's a lot of financial reasons to do that as well. So um, if you have to cover some migration costs or justify the change, usually it's around, okay, so if we move to the cloud, it means we don't have to replace that 
server, which would have cost us ten thousand dollars to to buy the hardware and software and pay someone to install it and all of those sort of things. So that's often the most common reason. But the other one, we've saved uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for organisations just by using video conferencing and and teleworking and working from home and those sort of things. So by reducing travel costs, you can actually say, well, actually, let's save $10,000 on flights and put that into a a, a new cloud-based system for communication and video conferencing licences or whatever it may be. Um, But I know the uh, IT people in the session will be more focused on defending against hardware failure. Like I used to have to be one of those guys who would get the alerts in the middle of the night if the server failed uh, and you know have to then have to worry about backups and restores and getting tapes from off-site storage and all those sort of things so you just don't have to worry about that anymore in most cases the other one is having that collaboration online so a lot of these tools again whether it's Dropbox or or SharePoint or uh, Google Docs you can access lots of things centrally And you can work on them together. So you can work on proposals. I can work on these slides with my colleagues. And we can, um, regardless of where we're based. And it gives you that single source of truth, the one final version. You don't need to save things 100 times with Matt's version, you know, 20th of May, those sort of things. You just have it once and you work on it together. So moving into some more specifics of types of cloud services. So there isn't just one, um, you know, one type of cloud thing. There's, as you can see on this slide, there's really what we call three categories. Now we've used Microsoft as an example, but again, most of these things are still relevant with Google or Amazon or, or some of these others. So there's the ones that we call software as a service. So things like Office 365 or OneDrive. So things that you essentially just buy and start using Uh, or or in Office 365 you get it free and then you start using so things like Yammer you just log in and and maybe create a group but then you send out invites and then you start using it so it's software as a service it's already set up for you Um, the other the next one is platform as a service so this is where Microsoft actually set up an Azure environment for you and give you servers that you can just log in, configure, and go. So that's the sort of platform environment that requires a bit of work and configuration, but overall is reasonably easy um, to use on top of. And then the third one there is infrastructure as a service, where basically they're giving you access to a whole heap of servers and you can do whatever you want with them. So the IT guys log in, build, build up their servers, and then they put whatever you want on them. So this is where you host your own applications or manage your own environment. Um, So you're not reliant on sort of Microsoft managing that for you. So the other example is, uh, and I won't go into too much detail because we have other webinars on Office 365, but I just wanted to give you the scenario of a cloud-based service like Office 365, again, Gmail do it as well, where you have a whole suite of applications. And one of the beauties is when it's cloud-based, uh, you essentially get what Microsoft uh, you know, provide to you uh, for free. And some of these are paid though, but uh, essentially they continue to build on top of these and continually improve them. And you don't need to essentially do anything to upgrade. You just always get the latest and greatest. So every week you just get something new that they've built or improved. So that's an example of a cloud-based platform that um, you you would use like Office 365. So the other thing is um, platforms like Microsoft Azure. Now again, this isn't too Microsoft focused, but uh, what, what that is is you can actually host your server. So if you your client management system says it needs to be installed on a Windows server, that server doesn't necessarily have to sit in your office. 
or you don't actually have to go out and buy a server, you can essentially rent one uh, from Microsoft Azure. Now, luckily, uh, you can get a $5,000 credit from Microsoft to rent a server and be able to you know, host your website or put your client management system on. Uh, and it's reasonably easy to, uh, to build. Now, we do have a webinar in a few weeks, actually, on, on Azure. So log on to the website and have a look at that. But uh, if you want more detail on how Azure works. Obviously, there's a lot of complex stuff there around data lakes and SQL databases and those sort of things, uh, mobile apps. But um, yeah, that's essentially the next stage. But if you just want to move your server across, you can do that to Azure or Amazon or it's a Google Cloud platform as well. So where, if you are looking at cloud serve, so you're essentially saying, yeah, I want to host my server in the, in the cloud. Um, really, one of the key things is, will your internet connectivity support cloud service? So it's actually very rare for me to recommend hosting a file server, like a traditional file server, in the cloud, um, because usually, the the lag time or the performance isn't great because every time you're accessing or viewing a file, you've got to do that over your internet connection. And a lot of not-profits don't have very good internet connections. So having a file server in the cloud often isn't a great solution. Um, so that's why we look at things like SharePoint or OneDrive, which are more designed for that cloud-based document management. The other one is the router. So often you need to upgrade your router to be uh, compatible to the cloud. Um, but the key one is, uh, is it always comes down to cost for not-for-profit. So what are your ongoing costs? So there's online calculators where you can work out, uh, you know, how much is it going to cost me? So it's, it's not always cheap to store things in the cloud, particularly if it's big uh, resource intensive things like SQL databases. So, uh, you know, you need to do your sums before you just put it all up in the cloud. Uh, even with the $5,000 credit, um, you need to be careful you're not going to go over that. Um, but it is it is great to be able to integrate with other cloud-based systems like Office 365 and Dynamics. So I will uh, balance out the argument. Uh, so that's about cloud servers. But I also... Um, wanted to give you some tips around uh, considering the cloud before I go into some local infrastructure. So really the other things to think about before you just go off and, and move everything to the cloud is uh, security and information um, security and where you want to store your information. Now a lot of people are very concerned, rightly so, about where their information lives and, and I really encourage you to explore that. There's been recent legislation about, around mandatory reporting and, and those sort of things, which have made a lot of people look into this, which is good. Um, and the key really is around understanding what information you're storing and where it's living and what the risks are. So most of the legislation and mandatory reporting or privacy principles, they're all about client information. So really the focus for most not-for-profits is where is my client information? So that means email, for example, if you're just emailing your colleagues to and fro and you're not talking about clients' names or, or phone numbers or um, health data or credit card details, then to be honest, it doesn't really matter where your email is, uh, whether that's hosted overseas on Gmail, uh, because you shouldn't really be emailing around client information anyway. So what's probably the most important is where is your client management system or the data around your clients? Is that stored in documents on your file server um, that you're wanting to move to Dropbox or is that on a client management system already hosted in Australia? Um, most of these providers now are becoming um, Australia-based. So Office 365 is hosted in Australia, in Melbourne and Sydney. So, but first you need to understand your requirements. Does it matter and what information and, and where does it live? Um, and then ask your providers. So if you're going to find a client management system, whether it's Salesforce or something else, you go and ask them where the data lives and 
uh, make sure that meets what you want. The other thing to consider is um, don't feel you need to go all or nothing or move everything at once. So usually we encourage people to say, well, just gradually move things uh, and potentially have a hybrid scenario. So it's about where the benefit is. So if you've got 10 servers and three of them are coming out of warranty in the next six months, maybe just move those three and keep your other seven until they come out of warranty. So um, it's working out what adds value and don't feel you need to move everything straight away. And I think the key is planning that architecture, making sure all your information is in the one spot and not moving some stuff to the cloud, having other stuff on the servers, or having some stuff in Salesforce and other stuff in SharePoint. It's trying to reduce that duplication. Um, but the other factor with cloud is obviously it's relying on the internet. So you've got to make sure that staff can work offline if they need to. So, you know, this PowerPoint presentation, for example, I have it synced to my laptop so that if my internet does play up, then it's uh, available on my laptop and I can work on it uh, regardless of the internet. And then it just uploads or synchronizes once the internet comes back online. Um, so have that redundancy if your internet goes down. But ideally, you would upgrade your connection to a more reliable connection or often we're seeing most not-for-profits now moving off those home ADSL connections, moving to a more reliable sort of higher speed connection. Um, and the last point there is around that hybrid scenario. So most of our larger clients have a bit of both. So, and we'll talk about some specific scenarios in a minute. But let's talk about um, whether you need local server infrastructure. So again, we're, we're agnostic and we do understand that you, know, you do need local server infrastructure in some scenarios. So, but what I, would like you to understand is what does that mean? What What is local infrastructure? And it's not always just big racks of servers. So even if uh, your organization can move all servers and all applications to the cloud, you're probably still going to need half of these things. So you're still going to need a modem to get your internet. You're still going to need a switch to plug all those blue cables in. You may still need a firewall to protect you locally. Uh, you might need a router to, to manage your traffic. Uh, you might need a UPS to manage, uh, to maintain the battery life or surge protection. Um, tape drives you probably won't need unless you're backing anything up locally. Um, and then you've got your phone system, which is your PABX as well. So uh, the NAS there, the network attached storage is sometimes instead of a server, if people just want some basic file shares, Sometimes people keep them locally instead. So when we're talking about local infrastructure, it's not all or nothing and it's not just move my servers and then I can get rid of that whole room where all those cables are. Um, in many cases, you still need most of those. So there are plenty of reasons to actually keep a server. So what we're actually um, saying is, some of these reasons we actually encourage people to, to buy servers or at least use Azure uh, servers to manage these functions. So before you just go and get rid of your local server, you need to understand what it does. And these are some of the things that are quite common for them to do. So we do see some not-for-profits still having those older databases or applications that can't be moved to the cloud. So there's some client management systems, I know CareLink Plus is one, that has to be server-based. Um, but even some of them, even CareLink Plus, are starting to have a hosted option where you can uh, have it hosted with them. But they're some of the reasons why you still need some form of server to manage those, unless you're wanting to move off those systems to cloud-based. The other one is storing your large files and videos. So we... Um, have many clients that have marketing departments and rely on uh, photos or videos to do a lot of their promotion and uh, marketing. And often those big things aren't great to be able to push up and down a, a small ADSL connection. So in those scenarios, we often recommend a local 
NAS or a local server or just having some form of storage locally um, to access that. And that can also act as redundancy if the internet connection is, is poor or, uh, or having issues. We still have some clients who can't get good internet at their location. So we have regional clients who get quoted exorbitant amounts to put in an internet connection because it's so regional and, and so hard to get. So that some in some cases, it's actually cheaper to buy servers than to pay for uh, $1,000 a month for, for internet in some of those really uh, expensive locations. The other thing that uh, when you've got sort of more than 20 PCs in one location is uh, it's actually sometimes more efficient to have some form of server. Now again, whether this is Azure or, or a local server, to manage those um, devices, whether it's managing updates or group policy or usernames and passwords or roaming profiles where people move between PCs. So these are the functions that servers are, are currently doing. But if you get rid of servers, often you lose that. And you wouldn't want to, you know, for the centralized update, for example, if you want to upgrade the Adobe Reader version on all of your 50 PCs in your office, uh, you can just push that out by your server. If you don't have a server, you may need someone to walk around to 50 PCs to do that update, which is uh, not very efficient. So often that's more cost efficient to have some of that local server. Or, or service. So when you put the two side by side in terms of the cloud versus the server, really the the key difference uh, that we're seeing a lot is that um, comes down to money, and it's the the different model as well. So um, those where people those scenarios where people used to get grants to buy that capital purchase of, of fifty thousand dollars or whatever it may be to buy the hardware, purchase the software, purchase the licenses, do the installation, and then have to maintain it on an ongoing basis, as well as upgrade it every couple of years. Um, that's becoming harder and harder and less sustainable for most not-for-profits. Uh, whereas the cloud option, you just buy it on a monthly basis, uh, you automatically get the latest version and it includes all your software and hardware and licenses in the one cost that you get from that vendor. So that's, you know, comparing zero where you just pay that monthly cost to, you know, something like QuickBooks where you have to uh, install it on the server, uh, buy the annual license, all those sort of things. Um, obviously, the thing about the cloud is it's relying on internet and hosted externally. Um, and you might want to consider local copies, so required for offline, whereas the server, it's relying on your local network, so all stored locally, and you're relying on those off-site backups. Um, so they're the, the two different models that, uh, that are, are quite common. Um, so I hope that's explained the difference when we talk about cloud or local infrastructure, what the, the two models are. And again, not saying there's right or wrong, and to be honest, it, it is blurring, the, the two models are blurring now with, with different cloud-based systems um, and service can be hosted in the cloud on things like Azure. So it's becoming less and less uh, black and white between the, and the differences between the two are merging. So some scenarios around what to do for your organization. So again, there's no right or wrong answer and there's no one solution. So I thought we'd give three different scenarios of common sort of real life ones that uh, we see all the time. So as I mentioned before, I've worked, I've uh, been a board member of a small not-for-profit and it was great, it was easy. Uh, we just said, all right, well, let's just move everything to the cloud. I did it one weekend. Uh, they just work off laptops, everything, email, file sharing, video conferencing, it's all cloud-based, client management and storing of all their uh, information about their, their clients and even finance and payroll and all of those things, all just one or two cloud-based systems. So cloud-based client management system, cloud-based finance system like Xero, uh, done. So that's their essentially environment, small and basic. Whereas some of our clients are those medium, if they've got 50 staff working in the one office, 
um, some of the cloud systems make sense. Like we move almost all of our clients, if not all, have, have email on Office 365, for example, because that's just a no-brainer. But some of these actually still feel they need a local server uh, for either it's an old application or that local file sharing for their marketing department to store videos and those sort of things. They, because uh, there's 50 in one office, we use the server to manage all the PCs and users, and uh, even some of them, they still host local finance systems. But we also use the cloud for backups. So we use Azure Backup, for example, um, to, to back up anything uh, locally up to the cloud in case there's an issue with that office. But the big one, uh, the other large organization there is obviously 200 staff. It's again a hybrid scenario where you're moving things like email and the majority of documents and files on an intranet, um, but you do still have a local server for managing those large files, but uh, most applications are cloud-based. So again, there's three common scenarios that we thought hopefully you can fit into one of those and try and get your head around which one of those is right for you. So the big question that we often get is around the internet connection. So, you know, what type of internet connection do I need to access the cloud? And unfortunately, there's no no one answer. I can't say everyone needs a this type, unfortunately. So there are a lot of different types of internet connections. So hopefully none of you are still on dial-up, which is the old, you know, the one that made that funny sound when you when you logged on, uh, that went over the phone line. So as a minimum, I think most of you would still be on would be on 3G or 4G. 5G is coming soon uh, around, and that's basically what you get on your on your phones on your mobiles. So essentially, if you hotspot off your mobile or try and access the internet over mobile, hopefully most of you are getting 4G. Um, you can use those for uh, not mobiles as well. So you can, a lot of people are getting those dongles or there is more and more of those fixed wireless solutions using 4G. And I think as 5G comes in, that will become more and more common as well where you can actually get that um, connection over the, where you don't need cables basically. It's obviously a little less reliable than, you know, it's affected by weather, it's affected by all sorts of factors. Um, ADSL is, is quite common, so a lot of our clients still, uh, unfortunately, have ADSL too, which is uh, the old style of, you know, over the phone lines. And generally, you're only getting under, you know, 0.9 of a meg, um, Upload and 10 meg download, for example. So that's quite a common scenario, and um, usually could be enough for one or two people, but not enough for an office generally. Um, so fixed wireless, we have a few clients where we can't actually get cables into their building uh, for, for certain reasons. So we actually need that um, wireless solution. But most of our clients now are going to what they call an Ethernet connection where they're getting those symmetrical speeds so they can get 20 meg upload and 20 meg download. You know, this is, let's say, $200 a month or $250 a month. Uh, but more and more are moving to fiber, which is the big offices where you can get 100 meg in and out in the city um, at reasonably good prices. And then obviously the NBN is going around as well. So, uh, Obviously, that's very dependent on um, providers and the plan. So a lot of the basic plans on NBN are essentially giving you ADSL costs um, and ADSL speeds, but hopefully it should give you the ability to upgrade to that faster speed if you want additional um, speed and costs. So again, I've come up with a few different scenarios for you for internet connectivity. And hopefully this helps you understand what's right for you. So there's no right or wrong answer again, unfortunately. Um, and in some cases, you know, having an ADSL connection, which to be honest is what I've got, what I'm on right now. Uh, and it's working okay for this type of webinar. Um, but if I had 
10 of you on video all sharing videos, it probably wouldn't be. Or if I was trying to do multiple things at once, uh, it probably wouldn't be. So that's why, you know, again, you just use it for certain things on certain days. Like I won't be downloading any massive files today. Um, and sometimes that's okay. An ADSL for an office of maybe up to 10 people, maybe some basic email and Skype, you know, you can get away with your $70 a month plan. Um, but once you get a bit over that, where you're starting to, you know, access your client case management system, you're wanting to use video conferencing, or you're wanting people to log into a, a finance system, then you're probably looking at more of those Ethernet connections or, uh, you know, looking at upgrading away from the ADSL. So particularly if you're, yeah, around 30 staff, you're wanting people to, you know, have a server, then if you've got a local server, you don't rely as much on um, on the internet, but it also depends. People are VPNing in and, and wanting to use the VoIP phones and all those sort of things. So QoS is quality of service for your VoIP phones. Um, so if you're running your phones over your internet, that's a whole other whole other issue. And then again, if you've probably if you've got over 50 in your office and you're you're using mostly cloud, you probably need those sort of fiber applications, which are, are becoming um, more and more common and more and more available. So hopefully those scenarios give you a bit of a sense of uh, you know what's available and what's suitable for you. But it is a very case by case basis thing and something that you should talk to your network provider or your IT people about. So hopefully today has given you a, a bit of a sense of designing your technology solution um, and given you some ideas on what's right for your organization. So I think the key is um, look at your future and look at how you're going to work in the future and then do it based on that. So a lot of these investments, even an internet connection is a two or three year plan nowadays usually. So, you know, plan it for where you're going to be in a few years. And before you go off and buy something or, or make any major changes, just understand what you need. So determine your requirements for the applications before you go off and buy them. And understand how your staff need to work. Are you very office-based or are you going to allow your staff to work from home or are, they going to, are you going to allow them to use BYOD devices or Macs or uh, work on iPads or are they all office-based on desktops? So those factors do change what the solution is. As I mentioned before, I also encourage you to stage the transition and do what adds most value first. Most of our clients actually consider a hybrid model and have a bit of both, cloud and infrastructure. So again, it doesn't have to be all or, what, all, uh, all or nothing, um, and particularly in the interim as you're gradually getting there, just do some of the easy ones first and, and see how you go. Um, and the last one there is, is get expert advice. But look, I'm not saying you can't do you know most of this yourself, but um, some of these things can get a little bit tricky. So even if it's an internal board member that volunteers for you, or or uh, you know someone who just does a small piece of work doing your review, um, then uh, yeah, I'd, I would encourage you to get a bit of advice. So, but uh, in terms of that, uh, yeah, happy to move on to questions now. So that they were the key uh, key sort of points from me, and. If we don't have, uh, you know, many questions right now, I'm happy to take them offline. Uh, Eric will send through my slides and, and my contact details uh, pretty soon. But um, feel free to jot that down and send me an email today if you've got anything specific you want me to cover. Or, uh, yeah, feel free to give me a call. So I did say I'd allow some time for questions. So we've got five minutes. So feel free to... Uh, type them into the chat box and, and Eric will call them out. So thank you again for your time. I hope that's helped for your organization. All right, thank you, Matt. We have got a couple of questions here, so I might get started with what we've got. So the first question I've got here is from Dean, and he's asked that, I'm hearing that exchange email in the cloud is very intensive on your internet connection to the point that it impacts cloud service delivery. Is it better to have exchange on premise and have the rest of the services in the cloud? 
Um, generally with email, uh, again, it, it depends on the specific uh, organization and how large the mailbox are and, and uh, the traffic and those sort of things. But generally with email, you're sending uh, emails, regardless of whether your server's locally or in the cloud, you're actually sending that mail in and out of the same in internet connection. So the difference between an, a local exchange server with traffic sending and receiving out over your internet and having exchange online and sending traffic in and out over the internet actually isn't a, a big difference. Um, obviously, all the traffic goes in and out and it also depends how you use it. So if you're using Outlook, then you are storing a lot of your information locally as well on the PC. So you store all your mail locally and then it synchronizes every time you send and receive. Um, whereas if you're just using the web browser version of Outlook Online or, or on the apps, then um, you're not downloading and uploading as much. But most people actually uh, would see Exchange Online as a bit of a no-brainer for not-for-profits, and it's now the most common email platform for not-for-profits. But uh, we do have, uh, one thing I haven't mentioned, we do actually have an Office 365 readiness assessment that we do for not-for-profits that does a bit of an assessment of whether your internet is going to be suitable for you, as well as all the other things like what version of Office you're on and Windows and your hardware and those sort of things. So if you are interested in um, getting a bit more advice uh, specific to you around uh, Office 365, then we do have on, available on Connecting Up website uh, the Office 365 written assessment. So I hope that's answered your question, Dean. Otherwise, yeah, feel free to email me. All right, fantastic. We've got another question here. This one comes from Jackie, and it's a question in a couple of parts that the second part probably either yourself or myself could answer at, at some point. Uh, the question here is, if we are operating on Office 2013, is it necessary to move to Office 2016, or can we move straight to Office 365? And the second part being, I've heard this is free for not-for-profits, but where do you access this? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. So um, this this essentially two versions of Office. Office. So there's the, the version that you buy through uh, Connecting Up, which is donated, but not free, that you would then install on your local PC. So Office, uh, it's called Volume Licensing, and you would buy that. The, the current version is 2016. The uh, next version, I think they've actually released the uh, uh, the the new version, which is coming out later this year. So Office 2013 still works. So you don't have to upgrade. Um, you can move your emails to Office 365 and still work on Office 2013. There, gradually it will become uh, you know, less and less functional because Microsoft keep putting in new functions in Office 2016 and then the new version of Office. So I, I do encourage you to look at upgrading at some point, but it's not always essential with 2013. 2010, I would recommend you, you get off as soon as possible, but 2013 should be fine. Um, so you can just buy Office Standard from um, Connecting Up. The other way to get a copy of Office installed on your PC is through Office 365. So when you get an Office 365 license, you can get free E1, which allows you to have your email and SharePoint and OneDrive and all of those things and Office Online. But if you want to install a copy of Office 2016 on your laptop, then that's a monthly cost. So I think it's about 4 14 a month for a copy of Office Professional Plus at the moment that you just pay on a monthly basis through your, uh, through your Office 365 tenant or through your IT provider. Um, so yeah, we're selling that directly to our clients and they just get that on their monthly invoice at the moment um, for Office. So that copy of Office actually gets you five versions. So it actually, uh, so right now I've got uh, one of those licenses and I can install Office on my laptop. I can install a copy of Office on my iPad, one on my Mac at home, and one on my iPhone as well. So I've got four copies of Office 
running, which means I can use Word on, I've actually got PowerPoint open on my iPad as we speak. So yeah, you can buy it either way. Um, but going back to your original point, 2013 also works fine. So it, it depends what you're after and what your motivation is to uh, to move. So again, a, a readiness assessment will help with that or uh, happy for you to email directly if that didn't answer your question. All right, we have still got a few questions here if you want to keep going for a little bit longer, Matt. Sure. Yep, all right, cool. I'll get to that. Yep, I'll get to the next one then that's coming from Sarah here. And Sarah has asked, for file sharing only, what are recommendations for using OneDrive versus SharePoint? Yeah, good question. So they actually both use the same infrastructure and both have the same features around version history, co-authoring. The main difference is OneDrive is actually owned by a user, by a person. So I use my OneDrive. By default, I'm the only one that can access OneDrive. So I keep all my working documents and those sort of things in OneDrive. However, anything that is something I want to share a lot with my organization or owned by my organization, particularly things like policies, procedures, even this, these slides, if someone else wants to run this webinar, this webinar, these slides, actually live in our SharePoint environment, which means it's easily shared by default with others. So generally how we separate the two is, if it's organizationally relevant documents, um, I'd put it in a SharePoint environment. If it's to do with an individual user and just a day-to-day -day working document uh, that don't need to be shared, you can put it in, uh, we would generally recommend putting it in OneDrive. But you, you can lock down SharePoint to be just yours, or you can open up OneDrive to be uh, shared. But uh, so it does depend on the solution uh, and the uh, sort of what you're using it for and who you're sharing it with and how secure the documents are. But uh, generally, we would say SharePoint if it needs to be shared broadly. All right, fantastic. Okay, so the next question we've got here, if you're okay, Matt, we've got one from Maribel, which who has mm -hmm. asked, with large videos and files that need to be sent externally, I've noticed that the medium and large companies tended to hold it locally. Is it not easier to send when it is accessible and can be shared easily on the cloud? Yes, so if you're sharing it, then yes, those sort of videos should be stored on, you know, even things like YouTube or Microsoft Stream or or even OneDrive and SharePoint. So it's all about whether you're sharing it or storing it. So when I, the scenarios I was giving before were more about storing it internally for your organization. When it's ready to share, then you, you store it on a sharing platform. So even this, for example, connecting up, we'll be sharing this webinar via GoToMeeting. So this is how they share uh, large videos or files. Um, I think they, they also had some on YouTube. So yeah, it, I think often where you store them while you're working on them is different from where you store them when you're sharing. So if you're the one actually editing video and you're doing a lot of work in uh, you know creating those videos, you don't want it to be on the cloud. But when it's ready to be stored, often you package it up and you, and you put it in a different uh, format to share it externally. So generally they're two different different things. Um, but I agree, Let, by, let's try and use the cloud as much as possible for those sort of things. And the other factor is if you store it on the cloud, you're actually not having to pay to store it locally or you know, you're know you not taking up all your service space storing huge videos if, if all you're doing is storing them once and letting them uh, be accessed externally. Just on a few of these questions, um, just to let everyone know, we, we also have other webinars on um, Office, more Office 365. There's one on Azure coming up. The, there's actually, uh, I believe there's one on SharePoint coming up, which is more about file sharing. And there's one about communication and collaboration in Office 365, which is probably, sounds like more of these questions are more Office 365 based questions. So uh, yeah, 
have a look at the upcoming webinars and keep an eye out for the newsletters um, around those ones. There's some on data coming up, there's one on Azure, and there's one on Office 365, I believe. All right, thanks, Matt. Well, we've got one last question here, and this is from Annette. And Annette has asked, we've been discussing migrating our emails off of their server to Office 365. They've received a quote to do this for migration, but for them, the quote was around $6,500. Can you advise if this is around the ballpark for this work? When I advised management of this cost, it went down like a lead balloon. <laughs> yeah, and look at, generally the costs are, um, dependent on the type of server you have and how much data you have and and what's involved in that migration uh look it's it, that doesn't sound exorbitant in terms of the time associated like particularly if they're upgrading office at the same time for example and running training and doing all of those things so the the thing i mentioned before the readiness assessment we can actually give you a rough ballpark on on what uh, it would cost to move. So it could be for you to get a like an, a second quote, essentially, uh, not that we would do the have to do the work or anything, just to get that comparison. You could do an Office 365 readiness assessment, which you can get through connecting up. But the other factor to think about is again building that business case to go. All right, well, if you don't move. I'm expecting that you probably need to pay more than six and a half thousand dollars to replace your server, if particularly if that includes installing, um, sort of buying the server, installing a Windows server and buying the license for that, installing your exchange, and um, paying for licenses at I think they're at least four dollars a user a license, and also. Um, any other work associated with that. So I, I think generally when we work it out, six, six and a half thousand is um, you know, often a, a good, a, a small price to pay to get there eventually. Um, but yeah, I'd need to know a few more details around if there's only five users, then yes, it's probably too much. If you're migrating a hundred users, then you're probably getting a good deal. So. It depends on the scope of that project, but uh, yeah, it, there unfortunately there are some costs in moving the data across and the effort associated with that. If all you're doing is starting a brand new organisation with some empty user accounts, then that's actually quick and easy. And yes, don't pay six and a half thousand. But if you've got to bring across all the mail, calendars, contacts, set it all up from scratch, train users configure all the mobile devices, do all those sort of things, then yeah, that's probably at least a few days work of some IT people that could cost 6,000. So sorry to be the bearer of bad news on that one. All right, brilliant. Thank you very much, Matt. And thank you very much everybody for coming along. Uh, I hope you've learned a lot from this presentation and that we didn't manage to get through all of your questions. If you've got any questions that come to mind later or you've got any feedback about this webinar, please send that through to events at connectingup.org and we'll get back to you offline. Uh, you can also contact Matt directly as he's kindly provided his contact details up there on the screen uh, and they will be on the slides that are going out as well. Uh, don't forget the recording will be available, like I said, with the slides there within the next week uh, and a link will be sent out to you, so do keep an eye on your inbox. Otherwise, thanks again for being with us. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you next time. And thanks again, Matt. Thank you.